we're going to jump into a couple of days of graphing now. And what we're going to do is we're going to use our calculators to aid us in graphing some simple graphs and then make some generalizations about those graphs that we find and go to a form of graphing in which we don't need to use the calculator to help us. So for this first graph, we're going to graph the absolute value of x. I don't really need a calculator to do this, so I'm just going to go ahead and grind this out. I've got a little xy chart I'm going to make. And in this case, I have x is here, y is here. It gets some positives, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. Absolute value of negative 2 is 2, negative 1 is 1, 0 is 0, 1 is 1, 2 is 2. Plot those points, and you'll notice that the graph looks kind of like a V. It goes linearly in both directions, and we'll call this point, for lack of a better word, a vertex. Point where it kind of bounces. Now, if I were to take and graph y equals x plus 3, I'm going to plug in those same values and notice what happens. Again, we'll do this without a calculator because it's really not that difficult at this point. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And I plug in a negative 2. Take the absolute value of that, that's 2, plus 3 is 5. Negative 1 gets me a 4, 0 gets me a 3, 1 gets me a 4, and 2 gets me a 5. So you'll see now that plotting these points, I also get a very similar looking graph. In both directions. Do another one. And absolute value of x minus 4. Pick these same points, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. Plug in negative 2, get out a 2 minus 4, which is negative 2. Plug in a negative 1, positive 1 minus 4, which is negative 3. 0 gets me negative 4. 1 gets me negative 3, and 2 gets me negative 2. Graph those, and you'll notice, once again, these graphs are all looking the same. The only difference is where the vertexes are. So then let's move over here. And now we have y equals x minus 2. Let's go ahead and use negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2 for my x, and we'll find our y again. So in this case, plug in a negative 2. Negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4. Take the absolute value, that's 4. Negative 1 gets me a 3. 0 gets me a 2. 1 gets me a 1. And 2 gets me 0. So if I graph this, we're going to first of all notice that, hey, this doesn't look anything like the previous graph that I had. It's a line almost. And that's not making a whole lot of sense because all my other absolute value graphs look like some kind of a V. Let's do this. Let's add a couple more points. Let's go 3, 4, and 5. And if I do that, Plug in 3, get out of 1. Plug in 4, get out of 2. Plug in 5, get out of 3. Well, notice now what happens. Now my graph looks exactly like the other graphs that we had. So something else is going on here. Look at the previous graphs that I had. Look at where the absolute value was, and look at where the numbers added and subtracted were. 
those numbers were on the outside of the absolute value sign. Whereas in this problem, we have a number inside the absolute value sign. That's got to make some kind of a difference. Let's check and see. So for the rest of these examples, we're going to use a calculator to get through the graphing a little quicker. So let's get our calculators on. We're going to type in the absolute value of x plus 5. So to do that, I hit the math button. I go number. And there's my absolute value. Hit the x plus 5. Close my parentheses. And then I'm going to hit zoom. And number 6, which is going to graph it in the standard window, or a negative 10 by 10 for both the x's and the y's. And here's my graph. Now you'll notice that this graph has moved over to the left a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 spots. And then let's just take a look at the table real quick. Now in this table you'll notice that... I've still got it set on my ask feature. Here it is. I'm going to change this to automatic, so I'm going to move down and move that blinking cursor over by hitting enter. And now I'm going to go look at my table again. And now you'll see I have things automatically filled in. Since it moved back to 5, I'm going to move this table back to negative 5. And you'll notice that when I move over 1, I've gone up 1. When I move over 2, I've gone up 2. And when I move over 3, I've gone up 3. Likewise, on the other side, move over 1, up 1. Over 2, up 2. Over 3, up 3. And if I take and graph that now, Let's pop these points in. Here I have negative 5, 0, over 1, up 1, over 2, up 2, over 1, up 1, over 2, up 2. There's that check mark that I've been looking at. And look at all the other pa er, patterns that I have from my other problems. Go back to the previous problem. There's over 1, up 1, over 2, up 2. Let's go back another example. Here's over 1, up 1, over 2, up 2. Let's go to our next problem. Over 1, up 1, over 2, up 2. I've got the same pattern happening every single time. It's just my graph has been moved. Let's take a look at another example. Now in this case, in the previous problems, I had additions and subtractions either to the outside or the inside of the absolute value. Now I have a multiplication. I want to take a look at this graph. And instead of using, well, I can use a half. Doesn't matter. So we'll go to our y equals again. We'll take a half. So I put all my fractions in parentheses. So there's a half. Want to hit the absolute value, which is math. Num. Absolute value of x. Close that. And now I'm going to take and graph that. You'll notice in this case that this thing bounces, but my shape is entirely different. It's much wider than it was before. In fact, if I were to pick a table for this, and I go negative, or x is here and a y is here, and I go negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. I plug in negative 2, and I get out a positive 1. Plug in a half, or plug in negative 1, I'm sorry, and I get out a half. 0, 0. Plug in 1, I get a half. And 2, I get 1. So now you'll notice I'm here, 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 and here. Notice I've gone over 1 and up a half, over 2 and up 1. So, my pattern has kind of changed at this point. My graph's gotten wider. And my bet is this half has something to do with it. Let's do one more. 
And you'll notice this time that I have three times the absolute value of x. I'm just going to plug in some numbers once again. Here's x and y. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. And we're going to see if this gets wider or something else happens, if it moves like it has before. Plug in a negative 2, I get out of 6. Plug in a negative 1, I get out of 3. Plug in a 0, I get out of 0. A 1, I get out of 3. And a 2, I get out of 6. And when I graph this, notice what's happening. This graph is noticeably steeper, skinnier, I don't know how you want to call it, but it's definitely changed. But my vertex is at 0, 0. So we've got something going on. There's got to be patterns happening. And in fact, there is. All absolute value graphs can be written in the following form. f of x is equal to a times the absolute value of x minus h plus k. f of x is the same as y. So a, in this case, functions as a slope. If I look at all my previous examples, let's take a look at the slope from this vertex. Up 3 and over 1, up 3, and over 1. Now notice that in this direction, it's a positive and negative since we're talking absolute value. So up 3, back 1, there's a negative slope of 3. Up 3, back 1, negative slope of 3. Let's go to the previous example. Here's a slope, rise of 1, run of 2. Rise of 1. And I go back to, so I have a slope of a half in this case. Go back one more. Notice my a value in this case equals one, and my slope is up one over one, just like it is up one and back one in this case. So going back to our general formula, a acts as our slope, or m. H talks about a horizontal translation, which means the graph is moving to the left or to the right, whereas K talks about a vertical translation. So one important thing to notice is that the H follows a subtraction sign. This is really important. And what it means is that whatever number follows the subtraction sign talks about the way the graph is going to move. Now let's look at our previous examples once again. So in this case, we had an h value equaling 2 because a 2 followed a subtraction sign. Therefore, my vertex moved to the right 2. In the next example, though, you're going to notice that there was no subtraction. But if I was to make a subtraction, I'd have a minus, a minus 5 equals a positive 5. So h in this case was a negative 5, and my vertex moved to the left 5. k follows an addition sign. So outside of the absolute value was a negative. So if I wanted to make that a plus, a negative 4, k equals negative 4, and thus moves down 4, which it did. M, once again, or the A value was 1, so my slope was up 1 and over 1. Notice when I go back one more, and K was equal to 3, my graph moved up 3. So now let's kind of put this all together. And not use a calculator, not plug points in, but try to graph it based on what we know, and then plug a point in to check. So here's a really difficult problem. If we were to pick x and y values for this, this would be difficult. However, we know that this number multiplied by the absolute value is my a, which is negative 3 over 2, which is also my slope. We know that the number following an x inside the absolute value, also following a subtraction sign, is my translation number. So h 
is equal to a positive 6, which means my vertex moves to the right 6. And then following this plus sign is my k value. So k equals 1. Therefore, if I move over to 6 and up 1, I'm getting that vertex point on my absolute value graph. And then from that point, I have a slope of down 3 and over 2. So if I go down 3 and over 2, that's one part of my graph. If I go in the other direction, down 3 and over 2, that's the other part of my graph. And without picking any points, I seem to have graphed this absolute value function. Just for fun, I'm going to take this point of negative 8, or positive 8, sorry, and negative 2 and plug it in to see if it checks. So if I take negative 3 halves times the absolute value of 8 minus 6 plus 1. In this case, I get a 2, so that's negative 3 halves times 2 plus 1 which is negative 3 plus 1, which is negative 2. And sure enough, that point checks. So without plugging any points in, I was now able to graph this absolute value function. All right, now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to write the equation of an absolute value function that looks like this. Well, this shouldn't be too much of a jump because I know my vertex. My vertex is negative 3 and 0 which means this has got to be my h value, this has got to be my k value. Therefore, in my absolute value, I have x plus 3, and plus 0, because that's my k value, and it's got to be out on the outside. Now I've got to look at what's my slope. I rise a total of 2, and move over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to get to my next point. So my slope appears to be 2 fifths. So therefore, y equals 2 fifths times the absolute value of x plus 3. I don't need to say plus 0. I can leave it at that. Now I have to make sure the point 2, 2 checks. So let's go ahead and plug the point. 2, 2 in. If I get 2 equals 2 fifths times the absolute value of 2 plus 3, this better check. 2 equals 2 fifths times 5, and therefore 2 equals 2. I've graphed this correctly. We're going to go ahead and do one more graph just to make sure we know what we're doing. I have an h value here of negative 3 and a k value of negative 4. Therefore, my h says I move to the left 3. My k says I move down 4. So if I go over 3, down 4, I put a dot, and this is my vertex. My slope, m, is equal to 2, or 2 over 1. From this point, up 2 over 1, both directions. Go ahead and graph. And without plugging in any points, I've now graphed this function. Here's a point of negative 4, negative 2, which should satisfy this problem. So if I say, here's a negative 2 equals. 2 times the absolute value of negative 4 plus 3 minus 4. See what I get out. There's negative 2 equals 2 times 1 minus 4, which equals negative 2. And it checks. All right. Make sure you solve your connect ed problems for lesson 9, and we'll move on from there.